Welcome to this month's podcast. My name is Ethan Hood. I will be um, doing the podcast today for the American Physical Therapy Association Neurology section, section Vestibular Special Interest Group. This month's uh, subject is Meniere's disease. And today we have a, a wonderful um, person on the panel. His name is Dr. Andrew McCall. Dr. McCall is an assistant professor at um, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in Otolaryngology. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of California, Riverside and his medical degree from the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. McCall completed his residency in the Department of Otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of California, Los Angeles, and he completed his fellowship in otology and neurotology at Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. McCall's specific field of interest includes otology, neurotology, cranial base surgery, disorders of the facial nerve, cochlear implants, acoustic neuromas, Meniere's disease, otosclerosis, and superior canal dehiscence syndrome. So Dr. McCall, first of all, thank you very much for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay. Now, as far as Meniere's disease goes, there, there's a lot of conflicting information, especially as, as a therapist, um, in terms of what exactly is Meniere's disease, what are the causes and everything. So can you shed the light for us it's exactly what is Meniere's disease? So I, I got to tell you, I wish we knew exactly what Meniere's disease, meaning what the the pathology that leads to this clinical condition is, but that's still a, a big unknown. Maybe you could shed some light on what the um, condition is, though. So Meniere's disease is a clinical diagnosis characterized by episodic vertigo, um, as well as some auditory symptoms, specifically fluctuating hearing loss, which is usually of a sensory neural uh, nature, as well as uh, feelings of oral fullness and tinnitus in the affected ear. It's really uh, thought to be a peripheral problem, usually in one ear, and um, that leads to the symptoms that I mentioned. Now, uh, the, the disease was named after a gentleman named Prosper Meneer who described that uh, dizziness and balance problems can originate in the inner ear, and that was back in the 1860s. And, and Unfortunately, today, we still don't really know what leads to this constellation of symptoms in a, in a given patient. There are uh, certain theories about that. It can be, some people think there may be a genetic component. Others argue for possibly a viral component. Um, versus others think it may be immune-mediated. Uh, immune mediated. Uh, and ongoing research is being done to look at all of those. But frankly, today, it still remains a clinical diagnosis. Okay. In terms of the theory behind endothelial high drops, is that still considered the, the, the main reason why Meniere's develops? Right. So endothelial high drops is a histopathologic correlate of Meniere's disease. So okay. what is done? At patients who have uh, were, were diagnosed with Meniere's disease during life and then donated their temporal bones to science after passing on. Uh, those temporal bones have been looked at, and what is seen is this uh, endolymphatic high drops in the vast majority of patients. And what that is is one of the fluid compartments in the in the inner ear is enlarged compared to normal. Now, nobody really again knows why that happens, but that's uh, nearly always the case, although not all, always the case. So, you you may hear uh, the term endolymphatics enolymph being used uh, as a synonym for Meniere's disease because of that. Okay. Now, are there the very specific clinical criteria that someone must meet to be diagnosed with Meniere's disease? So the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery did come up with clinical criteria. Um, and really, again, the, the criteria are episodic vertigo, and it should really happen two or more times that lasts for minutes to hours. Generally speaking, you're talking more than 20 minutes to many hours uh, of okay. vertigo. And again, that's that, that can be true vertigo where the world is spinning around, or it can be an internal sensation of, of movement or a tilting type of thing. Um, and then on top of that, there has to be, technically, there has to be audiometrically documented hearing loss in, in one of the ears. Um, and typically, that's uh, fluctuating in nature. So uh, when I'm seeing a patient, we'll often follow these patients over time, and we'll notice differences on their audiogram over time. Mm -hmm. And then there's usually either the sensation of oral fullness or tinnitus in the affected ear. And again, that's usually fluctuating in nature. Usually all these symptoms come together. Um, so it's quite common that a patient, either before or during a vertigo attack, will notice they're having uh, changes in 
uh, an oral fullness sensation or ringing in the ear, as well as maybe a drop in hearing that's transient and then recovers. Is um, there a certain part of the, 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 the frequency where people will lose their hearing? Is it low frequency, high frequency? Is it mixed? It's typically, uh, early on in the uh, course, it's typically a low frequency sensory neural hearing loss. Um, unfortunately, though, over time, the hearing loss may begin to plateau out. So in other words, in, in early episodes, it may fluctuate down in the low frequencies and then return back to normal. Well, eventually, it may start to not return all the way back to normal. And additionally, it may not, uh, the, the higher frequencies may start to go as the disease progresses. Eventually, after many years, it's not uncommon for patients to have a flat sensory neural hearing loss somewhere in the 40 to 50 decibel range with a significant drop in word uh, discrimination. So it's, it's variable based on where the patient's at in their clinical course. Okay. Um, th does video and seismography play a role at all in terms of diagnosing someone with Meniere's disease? Yeah, so VNG or uh, ENGs are both used uh, to try to diagnose Meniere's disease. What we're looking for in those tests, obviously, is a reduced vestibular response in the affected ear. That, unfortunately, is not, uh, you know, specific to this uh, disease process. There's other disease processes that can cause that. In addition, um, if during an active attack, uh, that may actually cause a hypersensitivity on one side and make it look like the other side has a reduced vestibular response. So certainly uh, VNGs are utilized in this, uh, uh, in trying to diagnose this disease. However, one must uh, use caution in interpreting the results. I understand. So a patient coming into you, what, what specific type of symptoms are they describing to you? I, I understand that they're, you know, they have an oral fullness and, you know, they have, you know, clinically they have to have episodic vertigo lasting minutes to hours. Um, mm -hmm. But what, what are they describing to you specifically? Yeah, so a typical patient who would come in with a, uh, who I'm suspecting Meniere's disease in would come in complaining of usually sometime uh, an, uh, some episodic vertigo that's happening several times a week several times a month, um, but again, it's variable. Some people will have less frequent attacks, some people will have more frequent attacks, but you're looking usually on the order of a couple attacks a week to a couple attacks a month. Okay. And what they'll describe is it's a very severe vertigo. They, they're almost incapacitated. They feel like they have to lie down. Well, oftentimes they do, and they'll fall asleep and then wake up hours later feeling better, but they're, they're really incapacitated by the severity of the vertigo, vertigo attacks in most cases. Um, it's common to have nausea associated with it. Um, some people have emesis as well. Uh, and then often they'll describe during the attacks uh, a, a real strong fullness or ringing in the ear, and some people will notice the hearing loss as well. Okay. Is there a certain, because of the, the, the severe nature of, of the symptoms, is there a certain percentage of patients that are disabled due to the Meniere's disease? So some patients are. Um, fortunately, uh, a lot aren't. Uh, there, there's no good, I don't think, any good data on what number of patients are disabled. Uh, I'd say the more common uh, scenario in which people dis are disabled by this disease process is when it occurs bilaterally. And there's considerable controversy in terms of how often that happens, but it's somewhere in the uh, 10 to 40 percent of patients will ultimately go on to develop bilateral Meniere's disease. And in that circumstance, they really don't have a healthy ear to rely on or to compensate on uh, centrally. Mm -hmm. That can be a really disabling condition. Okay. Um, however, you can imagine if you had uncontrolled vertigo in a unilateral Meniere's disease uh, patient, if it was happening frequently enough, they would have a very hard time being able to maintain employment. Okay. Now, as part of the differential diagnosis process, are there any other pathologies that mimic Meniere's? So uh, there's a lot of other pathologies that obviously can cause episodic vertigo. Uh, I, I would suggest that we should keep uh, common things in mind, of course. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is certainly one of the most common causes of vertigo. Mm -hmm. um, I mention that not just to say that that's uh, necessarily something that's going to mimic Meniere's disease, because that shouldn't really present with the fluctuating hearing loss that mm -hmm. Meniere's will. However, it's very common that the two disease processes can co-occur. So if somebody is being referred to you for evaluation of uh, Meniere's, you should also be thinking about PPPV. There's um, definitely a link between the two, correct? Oh, unquestionable. Yeah, yeah. there's very good associational data between the okay. two. 
Um, but of course, there's lots of other dizziness processes that can also mimic Meniere's. Superior canal dehiscence has auditory symptoms as well as episodic dizziness. Um, migraine can mimic a lot of different uh, pathologies, and that's certainly one. So, so there's any number of things that should be looked at when you're looking at a patient and thinking about Meniere's. On top of that, it gets a little bit more complex because not everybody with Meniere's has the full-blown Meniere's picture. Some people will have what's called vestibular-only high drops, and some people will have cochlear-only high drops, meaning they'll only have either the vestibular symptoms or the cochlear symptoms. Well, what's the theory behind having only vestibular or cochlear high drops? I don't think anybody really knows, to be honest with you. I think the just thought the is maybe... Present? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's more just a clinical presentation where it doesn't fit in the, uh, into any other category very nicely, and it cert the symptoms certainly do mimic what happens in Meniere's ear, but they only sort of get half of the syndrome, if you will, okay. the auditory, the vestibular half. And all other pathologies were essentially ruled out, so that's possibly the only thing that it could be then, huh? Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. Now, now for traditional Meniere's, uh, what would be the standard medical treatment? So most patients, uh, we talk about avoidance of triggers. So uh, dietary restriction of salt is commonly employed. Um, you know, most people would say keeping salt intake to less than 1.5 grams a day or maybe 2 grams a day would be reasonable. And the thought behind that is if uh, the salt intake uh, is too high or especially if it spikes throughout the day, that may cause a change in fluid homeostasis. And remember how we talked about N-lymphatic hydrops the change in the fluid compartment in the inner ear. It's thought if you get a spike in salt in the dietary intake, that may change the fluid homeostasis in, in the inner ear and per, uh, precipitate an attack. Okay. So we do uh, salt restriction. Uh, caffeine is also thought to be a trigger in some patients. Some patients, alcohol or tobacco use, so we cancel patients regarding that. Certainly stress and fatigue can be uh, inciting factors, so we encourage regular exercise and sleep in these patients. So those are really the lifestyle modification, modifications we start with. Also, very commonly is uh, a commonly first-line employed therapy is diuretic therapy, again, with the idea of trying to stabilize the sodium balance in the inner ear. So um, some sort of diuretic is commonly added. And then on top of that, then we can get into some more complex uh, therapies if patients are not uh, responding to that. Um, so there, I don't know if uh, you've heard of intratympanic therapies, but intratympanic steroids or intratympanic gentamicin is uh, sometimes given for this disorder. And then on top okay. of that, uh, there are surgeries that are sometimes done to try to control the vertigo. Okay. Um, now, when you look at the literature originally, you know, I've been personally I've been doing vestibular rehab for you know 17, 18 years now, and when we used to have patients have Meniere's disease, um, the data showed that there wasn't much that we could really do other than the low salt diet, possibly diuretic and lifestyle modification. Some of the the newer rehab research out there shows that vestibular rehab might actually be beneficial for patients with Meniere's disease. Um, for, from your perspective, when exactly is the best time to to start vestibular rehab for someone with Meniere's disease? So my perspective from, again, I'm an otologist, uh, my perspective is such that I think we uh, as medical providers and can do a pretty good job of controlling the episodic vertigo in patients with Meniere's disease, whether that's the, you know, lifestyle modifications and diuretics we talked about earlier or with an escalating therapy, uh, be it surgery or what have you. Um, I think the role of the vestibular physical therapist is imperative and uh, treating patients with Meniere's after the episodic vertigo has been gotten under control. So the, 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 the fundamental theory behind uh, vestibular rehabilitation certainly is that in, in unilateral Meniere's disease is that you're trying to train the brain to uh, basically re, um, reorganize itself so that it understands that it's getting good inputs from the opposite ear. And if we're having fluctuating poor input from the sick or Meniere's ear, that's really going to throw a wrench in that uh, system. So usually what we do, at least in my practice, is patients are referred for vestibular physical therapy after the episodic nature is, uh, is tamped down a lot with the medical therapy that we're given. Um, good candidates would be people who've had ablative therapy, certainly would go, undergo uh, okay. vestibular physical therapy, no question about that. Um, and then there's a fair number of patients who, after we're able to control the vertigo, say with, let's say with uh, lifestyle and diuretics, will have kind of a chronic disequilibrium. 
those patients as well, I think, you know, could benefit from vestibular physical therapy. Okay. Is there a certain time frame that, that you want the, the patient to have um, between exacerbations before you would start therapy? You know, um, it's going to... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say it's going to vary from individual to individual, you okay. know, and how strong their attacks are. Some people will have fairly minor attacks that, let's say, they're having them once a month, but it lasts for just a few minutes, and then they're kind of back to their baseline. I certainly think I, I wouldn't exclude somebody from trying vestibular physical therapy in that circumstance. But if somebody's having very frequent attacks, I mean, we're talking more than once a week or even more than once every other week that are severe in nature, mm -hmm. that person's probably going to have a hard time with physical therapy because you're going to get them to a new functional status and their, their ear's going to take another hit and you're going to have to work back up again. So spinning wheels, no way. Yeah, exactly. There's no real good hard and fast rule. It is kind of a gestalt, but the gestalt really should be that most of the vertigo attacks, if they're hap are, are controlled, although if they're happening, they should be mild and relatively infrequent. Okay, okay. Now, as far as Meniere's disease, are there any new treatments available on the horizon? So I think I alluded to it a little bit earlier. Um, you know, it used to be pretty standard that people would, you know, try uh, lifestyle modifications, maybe diuretics, and then they'd go pretty much straight to surgery. And um, in between that, we've been trying a lot of intratympanic therapy in more recent times with uh, intratympanic steroids or aminoglycosides. And that's really changed uh, the treatment algorithm for Meniere's disease. Um, so aside from that, I'm not sure that there's going to be much more coming down the pike, but, you know, we'll there's a lot of people looking at this, so hopefully there'll be even more beneficial treatments in the future. I can say one thing, though. There's um, one thing that may be helpful uh, for pinning down the diagnosis of Meniere's disease is a relatively recently described technique of using MRI to try to visualize endolymphatic high drops in a patient who's still alive, not looking at the temporal bones like we discussed before. Mm -hmm. And that could really help with some of the diagnostic uncertainty we were talking about earlier and certainly help us direct our therapy better. So hopefully that will pan out and uh, give us a better idea of what's going on in these patients. Would that be a very specific cut from the MRI? Would that be like IAC views with contrast? Like how exactly would, would you look at that with the MRI? Yeah, so people have uh, tried different things, but I think the thing that's most exciting is um, they've been getting MRIs, the IACs, but they've been putting in um, gadolinium into the middle ear and allowing it to permeate into the inner ear just like one would do with intratympanic uh, steroids. Okay. And it's that contrast that when it gets into the inner ear, it can highlight, let's say, the paralymphatic space, and then mm -hmm. you can look and see the endolymphatic space by default. So uh, that, that's pretty exciting. And if it really turns out to be sensitive and specific, uh, that would be uh, a really good advance in trying to more definitively diagnose this categorization of patients. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, it remains to be seen, but uh, it's exciting nonetheless. Very interesting, very interesting. Well, Dr. McCall, thank you very much for speaking with us today. We really appreciate it. It was absolutely a pleasure.